Okay, in that case, see, guard ki um, can, am I audible? Can you hear me? This is... Yes, I can hear you, Shakti. Okay, okay, Gargi. Okay, so the, Dr. Gargi Gangopadhyay for you all, she's going to speak on children's literature. Uh, of course, one way of introducing her would have been that she's also been a friend, a very old friend and a classmate, but I would here always introduce her as the person who I see as somebody who's always been devoted to children's literature, who's been working on children's literature for a long, long time now. So she is going to speak on the topic that she has decided what is the use of a book. What is the use of a book without pictures? So she, over to Gargi. And there's going to be, because I'm traveling, I'm, no, I'm going to give a more formal introduction with, during the question answer session. But now we are going to hear her out. And um, it's going to be Gargi. Right, Gargi. Over to you. Thank you so much, Hati. <laughs> I am sure, uh, you know, no more introduction is needed. <laughs> we are old friends and I am so happy to be here. I'm very thankful to Shati and her department uh, to provide me with this lovely opportunity uh, where I can talk about what she said is really my favorite subject in academics, uh, children's literature. So um, uh, I would just tell you one thing. Uh, if a, at any moment during my talk with you, uh, if my internet uh, is... Um, is kind of getting lost. Sometimes I do not know it myself. So I have asked uh, Shati, or if she is not there, can somebody please intimate me on my phone so that I can switch to another line and continue with the talk. All uh, right. So we'll do, um, we'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so let me put on my presentation. I have got a presentation which I hope will make my. Um, talk a little easier for me and a little easier for you as well. Uh, you know, because just listening to somebody speak uh, can be very boring. All right, uh, let me put it on. Can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I'll just check whether it is moving as well. Are the slides moving for you? I can see one. Same now path. you can see the ha, ha. It other is, one. It is, it is moving. It is moving. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right then. All right. Um, so let me begin at the beginning with the title. Um, uh, so uh, I would later come back to this point, this particular line, which I have taken from uh, the Alice book, as you know, what is the use of a book without pictures? And the entire sentence uh, in, in the book reads, what is the use of a book without pictures or conversations in it? So this is a child um, uh, who is uh, finding that uh, she is not uh, having enough interest in a book unless it's got some pictures at which she can look at, she can amuse herself, or in which there are plenty of conversations. So that in itself, uh, you know, becomes uh, a comment on the children's culture which had been prevalent during that time. And through the course of this talk, we will take a look at that children's culture, at the kind of books uh, 
that children had been reading um, in the contemporary time when this book is located in history. And uh, secondly, um, so this talk is actually a, a kind of an amalgamation of two separate lectures. So one is on the Alice books and the other is history of children's literature in um, England uh, or, or in English, I, I would say in England. Uh, so two different lectures and I have tried to uh, uh, to take the major trends, uh, the major points of both uh, and to encapsulate them within uh, a kind of 40 to 50 minute period. So um, I might be going a little fast uh, if at any point of time um, you want to clarify something or some concept uh, or some word that I used and uh, I didn't explain, please uh, do stop me and ask me. I will go back to it and explain it. And uh, yes, um, otherwise, of course, uh, you can ask me uh, anything also at the at the very end of the lecture. But I would prefer it uh, if, if you would actually stop me and ask me questions. OK, so those are the things that we are going to look at. We are going to look at the tradition of uh, children's books in England and uh, where Alice, uh, where where the Alice books come in in that tradition, and how they changed that tradition, or what were the new things that the books brought to that tradition? All right. So we are going to start with a very very basic um, question: What is children's literature? So Shati told me that uh, there are people here uh, who are from. Uh, from the other departments. So children's literature is something that is um, not just special to English literature. It is something that we all grow up with. Uh, you have all read books during your childhood. So can anybody uh, or can some of you answer the thoughts that are there in your mind when you look at this question, uh, what is children's literature? Would anyone like to express their thoughts on the subject? Just tell me some words or ideas any kind of category that you think of when you think of this question, what is children's literature? Yes, anyone? Think of the books literature that you read. Children and amuses children. Okay. It is something that amuses children. All right. Any, anything else? Ma'am, with pictures and other things, it keeps people, keeps children interested in a certain topic. Yes, okay. But there are pictures. So once again, we are back to pictures. Importantly, children's books have pictures uh, so that children are interested in those books. All right. And any, any other ideas? Like adventure, mystery, fantasy. There are various kinds of children's books, adventure, mystery, fantasy. Okay, thank you. Very good. A lot of ideas. Um, all right. Uh, the first was amusement. So, you know, when we think of children's books or children's literature, we also think of uh, things like textbooks, things like primers or spelling books or alphabet books, which uh, have... Um, uh, more of an educational purpose and not so much of an amusement purpose. But yes, education and amusement, these become the, you know, the fundamental uh, basis on which children's books are uh, grounded. And um, there are, yes, uh, various genres. So there are uh, thrillers, there are mystery books, there are adventure stories, there are school stories. Uh, there are fantasy fiction, there are poems, of course. Uh, so many kinds of uh, books that make up children's literature. So if we look at a very um, rudimentary definition, a very practical definition that is given by Kimberly Reynolds, um, uh, so she uh, says that generally children's literature uh, would include materials written to be read by children and young people, published by children's publishers and stocked and shelved in 
children's or young adult sections of libraries and bookshops. So uh, this is a definition that uh, actually refers to our everyday practices. So, you know, if we want to buy a children's book uh, for somebody, we would go to a place which sells children's books. We would look for a good publisher uh, who is renowned for publishing books uh, for children. Um, and of course, we are buying it for a child. So that is the general idea. And it includes all sorts of materials from textbooks to uh, didactic literature to um, sermons to moral guides to adventure stories and school stories. Uh, so basically, I have broken down the um, uh, the general definition. So these are basically the points uh, at which we are looking at uh, from this definition. So one is uh, there is a kind of suitability. So what is suitable for the child? So an idea of censorship obviously comes in when we think of children's literature. Uh, parents are often worried what their young ones are reading, uh, whether it is quote unquote right for them, um, advisable for them to read. The other thing is uh, the books are written in a particular kind of language and style uh, which uh, would be comprehensible to uh, the young people. Uh, suitable, you know, for ages five to seven, we have these categories written often on children's books or ages uh, 10 to 13, something like that. Uh, and uh, therefore, the books are products uh, that are designed with a very specific audience in mind, with uh, children in mind. And often it can be more specific, as I was saying, it can be for very young children, for young learners, or for young adults, which is a, now a, in academia, a nearly separate category. Uh, so, um, and uh, as you pointed out, uh, it is made for the purposes of their education, so information and entertainment or their amusement. Okay, um, but this definition uh, has certain problems and I am sure it has already crossed your minds that if you look at the first part of the definition materials to be read by children, so you take the example of the Harry Potter books, which are read by adults. Uh, also books like Tintin, which are eternal favorites. Uh, um, Annie Blyton's also, I'm sure we, I go back to Annie Blyton sometimes for comfort reading. And the other way around, uh, children also often read things that are not meant for them, that have not been written or published for children. So this is, you know, what we call the overlap category where, uh, uh, where the boundaries are crossed and they are crossed every day where adults read children's stuff and vice versa. So therefore, this is a very, very problematic area which in fact uh, diffuses the borders that have been put in by this definition. So um, in general, uh, you know, in general life, in our everyday practice, uh, this term children's literature is very unproblematic, but it becomes problematic once we are uh, looking at it from the standpoint of a formal definition, of a formal category. So in literature, uh, I'm sure all of you know what defines there is a formal definition for the epic, but uh, when you try to go about having a definition for children's literature, it becomes quote unquote impossible. I, I am quoting this word uh, from a book written uh, by a critic. And uh, she says, um, you know, impossibility of children's fiction. And, and she says that, uh, it is a genre that is so amorphous, that is uh, uh, so wide, that includes uh, so many things, uh, that it is nearly impossible to arrive at any kind of definitive description of the genre. And um, the, you know, the, the easiest way, the most uh, straightforward way, therefore, to bypass this problem of definition because we are dealing with a genre your paper you know your core course six is a paper where most of the texts uh, have been taken from this area of popular culture which is children's literature so uh, 
our way of defining or an easy way of uh, defining this very amorphous genre is to take the historical approach. Um, this is not a foolproof thing, but uh, as I said, this is uh, something that gives us a way forward. So the historical approach to children's books um, uh, is um, you know, a, a view uh, towards these books where we would be asking um, through the ages of history, what were the children reading, where their markets for children, niche markets uh, that would publish for children, were there authors who wrote for children and what were the subject matters and how were these books then different from the um, other numerous books and volumes being produced and sold for adults. So uh, uh, maybe this would give us a line of literature where we would um, find the tradition of what was actually uh, being read by children, what were being written for children and uh, published for children. Okay, one way of bypassing the trouble with the definition. So uh, the other thing when, uh, you know, the, the term that we have been using children's literature, of course, has this word um, child in it. So we had noted that these books are, are products that are designed for a particular audience in mind, whether it's for ages uh, three to five or ages um, seven to 14, whatever it is, uh, they have a definite audience in mind. So they have the children in mind. And now if I ask you, who is a child? Or you know, what do we mean by children? Um, again, you would find that it, it's not so easy to answer this question. Uh, at least there is no one single answer uh, to this question. Uh, so for example, maybe there are some of you who are above 18, uh, maybe 19 or 20. So technically you are adults, but uh, maybe uh, even now your parents and your teachers uh, look upon you as children or not as you know complete adults let us let us say with that um and if you look back you know a hundred years or so you would find in history that there were girls uh, who were 12 years old getting married having families having children of their own doing the duties of a mother um uh, if you look at the life of i'm giving examples you know from from our side of the world if you look at the life of Bidda Shagor, you would see that at the age of 14, he had started earning for his family. You know, uh, the, he was the bread earner for his family. And it was nothing extraordinary in that day. You were expected, you know, a person of 14 years was not considered a child. Um, he had to look after the family, especially if uh, he was the eldest. So therefore, uh, what we see is that this age which is the marker for what we define as childhood or who we define as the child this varies greatly with ages so sometimes uh, a 12 year old is an adult and you know now a 12 year old would be you know very very much a child with absolutely no authority of her own so a uh, childhood therefore uh, or the child, the definition of the child has got to do with a societal outlook. And therefore, it is a societal construct. It is uh, rather than being something uh, immutable, you know, something that's fixed, it is variable, it is dynamic, and it is subject to uh, the contemporary or the corresponding societal norms. So um, there is this book written by a French historian, Philip Arias, and he has this wonderful book, um, uh, which is called Centuries of Childhood, uh, where he talks about, quote unquote, the discovery of childhood in the 17th century. Uh, so if you read the quotation, um, that is where he is saying that um, uh, childhood as we know it today, or the definition of child that we have in our minds today 
comes into being as a societal norm, as a societal practice from around the 17th century. Now, when he's saying this, he obviously does not mean that prior to the 17th century, there were no children. Obviously not. Uh, he is neither saying that prior to the 17th century, children were not loved or, uh, you know, they were not shown affection by their parents. No, he's not saying that. What he is saying is that uh, there occurred a major shift in the way a parent or an adult, a governess or a teacher, you know, anybody who is an adult in the society would view the child, would look at the child, you know, what they would want to do with the child, how they would want to uh, bring up the child, how they would want to raise the child. So all these things, as we know them now, began to take shape from the 17th century onwards. Prior to that time, so in the, you know, the Middle Ages or earlier than that, um, the, the way the adults looked at children, the way the society looked at children was very different. And the major thing that he uses as part of his uh, argument, the major evidence that he uses as part of his argument uh, are paintings. So I have some for you. Um, so, you know, these are uh, paintings uh, from very early times and one from Middle Ages. So. Um, you see the baby Jesus. Uh, I am sure we would all agree that um, the baby does not look like a baby. Uh, same in the other picture of, uh, of the Madonna and the child with the angels. Uh, they have got very adult-like gates. They are, in fact, Jesus, Jesus is wearing a, a very, very adult-looking clothing. Um, and his expression, his hair, everything about him is that of an adult. That there is no child likeness in him. Uh, another painting um, from a slightly later period. So here's a mother with her eight children, and uh, you know, if you look at the faces of the children, um, they seem very somber. They seem very old. Is old the word? Uh, they do not look like children as they would look like now in a painting or in a photograph. Um, so uh, the the, uh, the theory that uh, Arias is uh, trying to put forward is that in, in these paintings, for example, he says it's not that the painters at that time could not paint well. It's not that, that they were inefficient and they could not uh, reproduce uh, the, the appearance of a child. He says that they painted children like this because they looked at children in this way. So when they looked at a child, they were looking at a miniature adult, uh, somebody who was uh, in the process of developing into an adult, was yet a half formed or uh, you know even less than half formed adult so uh, you see the dress that the little girl is wearing um, is uh, a replica of a very adult costume you know from uh, her hat to the ruffles of her sleeves every little detail about the dress uh, points to the fact that you know she is being shown in this painting as a miniature adult uh, so this uh, is from the uh, uh, later time when Eri says, you know, quote unquote, childhood has been discovered or rather uh, it is nearer to the concept as we understand it now. So even here you see the child is dressed as an adult, but very importantly, he is shown uh, uh, with the top. He is playing with the top. Uh, so he is uh, being portrayed in as indulging in an activity that gives him pleasure. He's doing it as um, something to entertain himself with. So that toy, that little toy changes uh, this painting, you know, gives it a different definition of the child and childhood uh, from the other paintings that I have 
shown you before. So as we move on, so we come closer to the Romantic period and Gainsborough was a very famous uh, painter um, of that period. And with the Romantic painters and finally with the Impressionist painters, we have the, uh, you know, the, that cult of the glorious innocent child that we are all acquainted with and today we think of the child as something like that you know the, because we are born in that culture uh, uh, so looking at a child would make us smile but it was not always so that is what uh, Arias is saying so uh, what he says is that uh, with the discovery of childhood uh, he uses this term there comes culture or cultures of childhood so why does this happen at uh, uh, you know, at the turning of the 17th century, he says that uh, because the mortality rates earlier, lots of children, uh, and we know this from literature, lots of children died uh, at a very young age. Uh, there were no vaccines for lots of diseases. Uh, so uh, with the 17th century, mortality rates uh, declined and uh, uh, there was an increase in the size of the middle class, which led to a more affluent or a more stable economic base. There were growing number of schools. So more and more children uh, were being uh, taught to read and write and um, pedagogy and child rearing. So there were books on pedagogy and child rearing because these became very important areas of social concern. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, parents uh, or guardians or governesses were um, uh, were being told what to do with the child and what not to do with the child. Um, and uh, along with all these things, the child also becomes obviously a consumer because there are clothes, there are toys, there are games, uh, there are um, books that are now designed for the child. So with this, then, we also have as part of the cultures of childhood, we have the rise of books that are meant for children. So we come to the second part of the lecture, which is uh, very, very short because I, you know, it's absolutely useless if I go into a very in-depth study of uh, children's literature because there have been five centuries of children's books in England. So what I will do is uh, take a quick glance at the major trends, at the major influences, and that will give you, um, you know, uh, a very basic idea of what was happening through the ages. So uh, we have the beginning of children's literature almost always in you know, all the cultures. Um, uh, we, we have the, sorry, yes, uh, the beginnings with textbooks. So the earliest books for children in all cultures are textbooks. So uh, these are books that are meant to teach the child either the alphabet or the or some rhymes or grammar, uh, books like these. And in England, it was the Puritans who started uh, the very first books. Uh, you know, they were writing and publishing the very first books for children. And these books, because the Puritans believed in the idea of original sin, uh, so uh, they thought that uh, from very early on, the children should be made aware uh, that they were sinners and they had to live their life uh, uh, with utmost holiness uh, to, to pray on Sundays and to uh, be obedient and to be always good uh, so that they could move forward to the heavenly life. So these were the typical godly books that uh, they wrote. And uh, so they were either for instruction or they were for, uh, uh, you know, purposes of uh, uh, preaching christianity or christian ideas to them so they were stories from the bible or fables or moral stories so this is an example of uh, a very well known what was then a very well known children's books written book written by james Janeway, and uh, the preface says so you know when uh, it, it is addressed to the child and uh, it says that uh, have you shed a tear when you have uh, read this book? 
uh, did you cry uh, or or are you the same as before are you careless and foolish and disobedient and wicked as ever so you see this is the concept of childhood that these authors had back then and you know i am laughing at this now because this idea appears to ridiculous uh, but this book was in print so it came out in 1671 72 and it was in print till the end of the 19th century so a very long time and it it was obviously it it was therefore bought and probably read by lots of children so this uh, i don't know whether this would uh, strike a chord but uh, if you if you have read jane eyre so uh, there is a character called mr brocklehurst and um, he asks jane whether she would uh, eat a cake or whether she would rather read a prayer and poor jane she answers that she would eat the cake and uh, mr brocklehurst is absolutely aghast and angry and she says oh you wicked child i know a very good boy who would never even look at the cake and only read the prayers and so on so it's in that line that this this uh, trend of you know godly books for children puritan books for children can be traced down to Mr. Brocklehurst and to the Lowood Institution. The next major influence comes from John Locke, and um, he has these very uh, two very important um, treatises. And the next, uh, of course, the the second one, uh, some thoughts concerning education, has uh, even today it has a very very major impact and is a you know part of. Uh, uh pedagogical ideas and so in opposition to the puritans uh, deviating from their idea of original sin lock uh says that the child is not a sinner when uh, he or she is born it's a he of course at that point um the child is a blank slate so the mind at birth is a blank slate or a tabula rasa and he says that education is the most important thing um and it will make a great difference the right kind of education the right kind of discipline will make a great difference and uh, he has this idea of making learning um recreational so uh not to be in simple words not to make the books so boring or make the lessons so boring so let there be a story and let the story teach the lesson to the child so this idea of instruction and delight comes together in lock very importantly and finally uh, of course being a philosopher of the enlightenment lock prioritized reason over imagination so uh, he said that the nurses or the governesses should not be telling fairy tales or imaginary tales or should not be scaring the child with imaginary things that th there will be an ogre who will come and take you away because uh, lock believed that these tales would permanently leave uh, an imprint in that white slate on that mind uh, so Uh, the parent or the nurse or the governess should be very very careful in whatever they are telling the child whatever they are exposing the child to because that will get written on the blank slate and what gets written will not get erased even when the child grows up to be an adult so these ideas then are uh, found in the next um um kind of children's books that we have uh, post enlightenment and this is a very famous example again for many ways uh, for many reasons this book was very different from its predecessors so um uh, first you see in the in the verso page there is this uh, imprint of there is this this, this uh, engraving of the adult who is reading to the two children um in front of a fireplace so it's a domestic setting a familial setting and we have the words instruction with delight so 
the, the motto given by John Locke to merge instruction with delight. And this book, um, you see, talks to children um, in a language that is specially made for them. So this book is, first of all, tiny in size. It is a, it's a, of a diminutive size. It's a little pretty pocket book. And it is meant for Master Tommy and Pretty Miss Polly. So either for a small boy or for a small girl. And um, when they buy the book, the boy will get a ball in addition to the book. And the girl will get a pin cushion. So you see, advertisement comes in in a big way, in a major way, uh, from very early on in children's literature. And children become consumers in more ways than one. So another very famous book from the same publisher, uh, uh, his name was John Newbery, and he was uh, he he is called the father of children's publishing in England. So this was a tale about a little orphan girl who began from a very uh, uh, you know who began from very modest, humble conditions. She only had one shoe, uh, but through a life of hard work and uh, because she was so good in heart she was so pious she becomes um, and when she grows up into an adult she becomes a lady and she becomes rich so typically a rags to riches story with the idea of reward so if you are good you will get rewarded and vice versa if you are bad you will get punished uh, the third most important influence comes from Rousseau, uh, uh, the French philosopher, and in this book, Emile, or On Education, he outlines uh, what he considers to be the um, ideal education for a boy. This boy is called Emile. Um, and Rousseau uh, brings in in a major way, the cult of the innocent child. So again, when we today think of the child uh, as an innocent creature, uh, it is to Rousseau that we owe our uh, you know, line of thought. Uh, so the cult of the innocent child, and he believes that the child is born innocent, but the society corrupts him. So uh, when this boy, um, is very young he is sent off with his tutor in an island where he is living only with his tutor and uh, Rousseau believes in natural education in practical education so in the beginning the child is not taught to read or write the child is taught uh, you know all kinds of practical things that he would uh, uh, have to know in life in order to survive. So he learns how to build a boat. He learns uh, how to catch a fish uh, or, or how to find his food. He learns how to build a shelter, all those kinds of things. And he is only given a book uh, when he is uh, eight years old. And uh, Rousseau actually names two books uh, as ideal examples of the kind of books that the child should be given. One is Robinson Crusoe. Obviously, you find the similarity. Why Robinson Crusoe would go down very well with a child who has been living on an island all on his own and uh, learning all kinds of practical things. And the second book is Aesop's Fables. In place of reason, uh, you know, uh, the, the reason that was prioritized by Locke, Rousseau champions feelings and sensibilities and the language of the heart. And of course, there is a very, very strong uh, focus on morality. So um, with the Romantic period, uh, we are uh, absolutely near to the, or in the modern concept of the child. So if you remember the earlier paintings, and if you look at this painting by a very famous uh, Romantic portrait painter, uh, Joshua Reynolds, and the title of this painting is The Age of Innocence. So childhood, now far from being wicked, disobedient, far from being that very straight-jacketed, adult-like um, uh, being, is looked upon in, in the 
you know, indulgent way as uh, somebody who is free, somebody uh, who is, in fact, if you remember Wordsworth uh, a little later, somebody who is the seer blessed, in fact, who is the father of man, who is better than an adult. And we have uh, Blake's Songs of Innocence. Uh, and again, if you look at the title page and contrast it, you know, this image and uh, this image, a lot of similarities and a lot of differences. So here uh, we have the adult and the adult has a hand raised. So the adult is instructing the child. You know, the adult is in control. She is reading out to children. The children are looking up to the adult. The setting is inside the house. And here we have the outdoors, the natural setting, the setting glorified by Rousseau. Um, we have the children who are reading to the adult. The adult is passive. The, it is the children who are uh, you know, the active participants here. Uh, and of course, the vine, the, the typically Blake, <laughs> the great Blake uh, design. So I, I will not go into that. Uh, but obviously, the, the differences are very, very clear. And that is how uh, childhood and children's books changes through the ages. So uh, there were many, many uh, writers during the Romantic period uh, for children. Uh, so for example, the very well-known nursery rhyme that we all know, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, uh, was part of a book, was written by Anne and Jane Taylor uh, as part of a book called Rhymes for Children. And uh, Mrs. Barbold, also famous uh, as a children's writer, so, you know, if you read some of the hymns that she writes here, they are very, very Wordsworthian. So she says that I need not tell you about God. You go out into the open field and you will find God in every blade of grass. So very, very Wordsworthian. Um, side by side. So we have seen three major trends. One was the Puritan, one was from John Locke and his focus on reason and discipline. The third was Rousseau and the cult of the innocent child. Uh, so books that came from or that were made from all the three pedagogies did not include uh, the books that we would choose now uh, to gift a child. So for example, books of nursery rhyme or the fairy tale, they were not there in any of the three different influences that uh, shaped children's literature uh, till the Romantic period. So uh, as in all ages, children read books that were not meant for them. And here we have the concept of chap books, which were not sold in the uh, you know, big expensive bookshops in London or in other cities. These were very, uh, uh, you know, they were not bound books at all. So they were made from one piece of paper and that paper was folded into four or eight or 16 pages and badly printed, uh, roughly printed. And they were sold by peddlers. So they were salesmen who carried them in bundles in their back along with a uh, hundred other things. And they were sold to farmers and shepherds and laborers. Uh, poor people in the villages and they cost uh, about a penny each and so after a hard day's work these people would gather by the fireside and they would want uh, a splendid story they would want uh, a magical tale or they would want a romance they would want a scandal or some jokes so these books provided them with everything you know the nearest example that comes to my mind are the books that you find on the local trains. So, you know, there can be books on how to cultivate vegetables uh, in your own uh, little veranda of, or, or how to cure some diseases. So everything would be there all together. So in the same line and children took to them because uh, they told great stories and the other stuff was very watery for them. So, 
towards the beginning of the and, and you know very importantly how do we know that children read these stories um, especially the romantics all the great romantics uh, wordsworth coleridge lamb de quincey they talk about in, the, in their memoirs and their writings they talk extensively about how they survived their childhoods by reading these fantastic tales so there are you know very very um, uh, well founded evidence that children had been reading and enjoying these books for a long time so it is only in what we call as the victorian period that ultimately the children's publishers bring out for children they publish for children uh, those are you know those incorporate fairy tales or folk tales or what we now call as fantasy literature you had pointed out you know the closeness of this word fantasy with the domain of children's literature so um we have uh, german popular stories which were the translated version of grimm's fairy tales uh, published in 1823 for the first time in england and uh, we have hans andersen's wonderful tales for children in 1846 we have um, charles kingsley's water babies in 1863 and in 1865 we have the first alice book so um, that is how um, in the 19th century there is uh, th there is an intermingling of morality with levity and finally children have something that they actually enjoy and that are actually published for them they, which are not you know they, they do not contain body jokes uh, or they do not contain adult stuff but they are designed and illustrated and published for them and they are not preachy or didactic they don't try to discipline or educate they are telling them stories which is what children's books are about now you know that is the idea that is how we would choose a children's book uh, we would not choose a book of grammar we would choose a great story so a uh, side by side i gave you this timeline in order to point out um, apart from the works that are magical or fantastic we also have obviously during the victorian times works like oliver twist jane eyre little women hard times um bleak house so victorian age is the age of high realism the high tide of realism and when we look at this date 1865 and 1871 in order to place the alice books in the historical context we have to be aware of this duality in the victorian period that it was a period that was overlaid with this uh, obsession with reality and there was this strong undercurrent of fantasy beneath that blanket um and side by side i have not given the dates but uh, you can find them out uh, there were through the victorian period in fact uh, earlier earlier than that as well um a series of acts uh, being passed like the elementary education act the factory act the chimney sweepers act six of them in all the poor law amendment act and together they uh indicate that more and more thoughts were de being devoted or at least more and more measures were being attempted uh for protecting children for giving them the benefit of education for recognizing that specially in childhood there is a need of getting good food a uh, clean shelter and um uh, the right to education so all that is happening simultaneously during this time so finally we have come to the date of the alice books and i will quickly go through the major points um and not delve very deep into the text uh, in fact i have not i will just look at it again from the point of view of the historical tradition that we have already talked about and see how uh 
that tradition is affected by this very unique book. I would want to show you a little video here. Um, can I do that? Yes, Kargi, go ahead. Actually, Shatik, tell me how much time do I have? Otherwise, I can just give the link and they can also catch up on it later on. No, I think if it is not a very long video, you still have some time to, you know, it if it adds to whatever you're saying, you know, it will make more sense, I'm sure. Okay. All right. All right. Only Gargi, while you're showing it, uh, could you yeah. switch off your video because they might just have data issues and okay. you know okay, they okay. might lose it. Yeah, I'll do it. No, the sound of the video is off. There's is a it? mute button. Yeah, the mute button right on top. I don't know. If it's on, on my side, I think it's on also. Can you hear it? No, ma'am. No, there's an off thing here. I'm not really sure what that is. No, but I can hear it and my speaker is also on. I I don't really know why it's not happening. I am not very good at this. But the, but the, it's it's not muted. It it is uh, very much on. Just let me know once more whether you can hear it or not. Okay, play it. Let's see. Mm. I couldn't. Okay, so what I'll do, I will just give them the link. In fact, I, I had only intended uh, that they should be watching uh, the beginning of the video because it's a long one and they can watch it later on, right? Let me carry on uh, with my presentation for now and... Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they will uh, have a look. It's a very, very uh, well-written, well-produced, uh, uh, fantastic information there uh, put together uh, for anybody interested in Lewis Carroll or the Alice books. Uh, so it would be quite rewarding to watch that video. All right, I will carry on with my presentation. Yes, so um, uh, we have these two dates, uh, 1865 and 1871. So one book is the um, sequel of uh, the other, uh, and they go on to tell the uh, different stories, but about uh, the same person. So Alice, uh, Alice, uh, the, the protagonist of the first book, is also the protagonist, only she is older, uh, but also the protagonist in the second book. Right, and we have Charles Lutwidge Dodson, who uh, was a uh, dawn of mathematics, professor of mathematics at Christchurch College, Oxford, 
who wrote under the pseudonym Lewis Carroll. Uh, and this is the girl, Alice Liddell, with whom uh, he had a very close, a very special friendship. And uh, uh, therefore, um, when we look at the book, particularly from a critical angle, uh, we again see a kind of public-private duality in the book. Uh, so the story was told um, on one lovely afternoon on a boat trip. Uh, these three little sisters had been there and they had asked Dodson to tell them a story. Uh, and uh, he had told them, you know, he had just thought up the story as adults do often. They make up stories on the go. And he told them this tale, uh, which little Alice uh, liked so much that she said that, please write it down for me. And uh, two years later on, so the story was told to them on the 4th of July, 1862. And uh, two years uh, after this, for Christmas, uh, Dodson or Lewis Carroll gave, uh, presented Alice with a handwritten and hand illustrated, you know, beautifully illustrated uh, and handwritten manuscript of the book. And here you see the title originally had been Alice's Adventures Underground, which later when he decided to publish it uh, for the general public, uh, he changed the title and other things too changed. But uh, this was the last page of the manuscript. So he had written it all by hand. And this is the drawing of, of Alice Little that Carol had drawn um, in his own attempt at a sketch. So uh, therefore, this uh, particular story, the context of how later on it was, as I told you, published, and then the illustration was done by John Tenniel, a very, very famous illustrator. Uh, but this story, uh, that was born out of uh, a friendship, um, a very uneven friendship between a 21-year-old professor of mathematics and this little girl who was seven years old. Um, and uh, the prefatory poems that are there. So uh, both the books are prefaced uh, by poems. Uh, and when we look at the poems, uh, we find that these poems are addressed uh, or they are situated in that very private sphere in which uh, the tales were told and the tales were written and the tales were conceived. And uh, the, the tone here, uh, if you go through the poem, so this one uh, you know, has Alice's name in it, all the first letters, the acronym, A-L-I-C-E, Alice Pleasance Little was the entire name. So therefore, there are uh, marks of that personal friendship embedded within the books. And the tonality of these poems uh, border on uh, a kind of grief, lament, uh, nostalgia for something that is past, you know, that something that is going away. Uh, whereas the books themselves, as you know, uh, have this absurd, comic, bizarre uh, things happening. So therefore, it is, uh, it, it, it's uh, with a bit of uh, discomfort, you know, that if we only look at the text within, we label it as fantasy, as books for children, as literary nonsense, as a modern fairy tale, come what may. But when we look at the production, uh, at the critical history of the text, how it was uh, told, how it was handwritten, how it was hand illustrated, how it was gifted to that friend. And if we look at these poems, uh, there is a dissonance between the tone of these poems and the flavor of the uh, chapters in the books. So that is also something that uh, makes this book very interesting. And we are in this territory of uh, children's literature or something that is something outside the boundaries of children's literature. That is a question you know, that's, uh, that we can have interpretations. We can, have, we can attempt at answers, but there cannot obviously be a definite answer. 
So that is one thing about the book, uh, about the books, both the books. Um, so um, this is again the line that I started with. So um, the staple books for Victorian children, already know by now, they were didactic. They intended to preach, moralize. Uh, they were uninteresting. They were boring. And Carol's books, the Alice books, were refreshingly different. So they have games, narratives, you know, the puzzles, riddles, rhymes, songs, word plays. They have animals that talk, animals that quarrel. Uh, they are a mix of dream and reality. There are lots of conversations and arguments in it, and there are illustrations. So in a number of ways, number of important ways, this book stood apart from uh, its predecessors. Uh, and here we have the personal element or the biographical uh, details of Charles Lutwidge Dodson coming in as well, because he was a mathematician. He loved uh, uh, he loved puzzles. He loved riddles. He he loved uh, inversions and reversals and problems of maths and logic. He loved photography. He also loved little girls. And Alice was one of his very special friends. So uh, that again brings us uh, to a very very author specific context of the books of why there are elements in these books. Uh, it is they are there because uh, it is Charles Lutwidge Dodson writing them. It is a professor of mathematics writing a book for his child friend. Um, the setting of this book is uh, a dual setting. Again, it is not a fairy tale setting. It starts from a real world, which we call the armchair world. And it then goes into the Wonderland in the first book and the Looking Glass Land in the second book. Um, and this is the point of contact where the glass starts to melt away like a mist and Alice climbs out uh, onto the other side of the glass. Uh, and this transition is achieved through this mirror. You know, once this doorway is opened, many possible and it, in, very briefly, the plot is that of little Alice who undertakes a journey um, uh, through an unfamiliar land. She meets many, many characters, all of whom are very quarrelsome, all of whom are very argumentative. And uh, finally, there is also a game happening in both the uh, both the books. Uh, in the second book, it is that of a chess. Uh, there is this chess problem. And at the end of both the books, uh, the child Alice, she takes control. So she dominates over the others. And uh, both books end in a kind of chaotic situation. And she wakes up from her dream. Um, so fantasy is a very, very a primary word uh, that is used for the Alice books. And uh, you all know what it, a fantasy is. It is a different world. It's a secondary world. It is the world of fairy tales. However, uh, the world of fantasy here is different from the world of fairy tales. So if you look at uh, this particular excerpt uh, from the fairy tale, you would understand that uh, when we are reading a fairy tale, we Actually, uh, I, I'll use a phrase uh, from Coleridge, willing suspension of disbelief. That is something that we all do. We suspend our disbelief. So we don't question how a pumpkin turns into a carriage. We feel that it is possible in that fairy tale world. So this is what Eric Rapkin calls ground rules. And Eric Rapkin says that uh, ground rules are set up by all texts, and it is necessary for the reader to participate in those ground rules for the text to make sense. However, what is happening in Alice is very different. Um, for example, Alice says here, oh, tiger lily, it's a beautiful flower, how I wish you could talk. And the tiger lily answers, we can talk. We can talk better than you can. So See, this is something that does not happen in fairy tales. Alice here is not expecting 
the magic that happens in fairy tales. Alice is not a condition that exercises willing suspension of disbelief. She is retaining her armchair sensibilities and armchair world logic. And she says, therefore, when she says, I wish you could talk, what she means is that actually she does not expect the flower to talk, but the flower answers back. So this fantasy is a little more complex than that of the fairy tale. So here we have uh, what, again, Eric Rapkin calls, uh, sorry, not Eric Rapkin, another critic, Rosemary Jackson, calls as a contextual fantasy. So the fantasy is changing. You know, the ground rules are constantly breaking and shifting. And therefore, there are surprises one after the other. So uh, uh, the, the fantastic situation is always contextual. It is always relational. So yes, uh, this is what Rapkin says about ground rules and uh, about fantasies. And he points out how fantasies like the Alice books are different from the uh, more linear, the more simple fantasies like the fairy tales. And uh, the other word that we think of when we think of the Alice books is that of literary nonsense, which is a genre by itself. And there is a famous predecessor uh, to Lewis Carroll here, who is Edward Lear. And uh, nonsense has got its own characteristics. So once again, for the first time, uh, a very elaborate world of literary nonsense. Lear had been writing poems. So Lear had been writing, you know, nonsense alphabets, limericks, but uh, an elaborate nonsense is being constructed for the first time. So a new genre is being put forth through the Alice books. And there are a number of characteristics of the literary nonsense uh, that are later taken up by other writers as the genre flourishes. And here are some of them. I, I will not go into an analysis of these characteristics, which uh, <laughs> will take a lot of time. It is not necessary. But what is necessary is for us to understand how groundbreaking the Alice books were coming you know, at those points of time when they did in 1865 and 1871. The child in uh, Alice text uh, is very different from the children or from uh, the other characters that you meet in uh, the contemporary fiction. Um, and Carol has his own definition, you know, own vision of the kind of child that Alice is like. So we find that Alice is uh, very curious. She speaks her mind. Uh, she questions all the things. So uh, this golden childhood that we associate with many later writers like Annette Blyton, uh, like C.S. Lewis, comes to life with the Alice books. And in many ways, uh, Carol is at the same time depicting the typical Victorian child and subverting it. Because at the end of the book, uh, it is the child who becomes the queen. It is the child who takes power and control. And she says that, I don't want to be anybody's prisoner. I want to be a queen. And there are, at the same time, parodies and criticisms of the kind of boring, watery literature uh, that children were given at that time. So all the poems that you see in the book are parodies of some preachy poem or the other. It is also a dream narrative, and that is what makes the text particularly susceptible to psychoanalytic criticism. They're fertile grounds for psychoanalytic criticism. Uh, and uh, they are also, in, um, in, in very important ways, uh, what we would now call postmodern or open-ended novels. So the ending of both the books uh, raises a doubt, raises a question. There is no closure at the end. There is no definite answer of who actually dreamt the dream, who is a part of the other's dream. Uh, so there is this lingering uncertainty at the end of both the books. Illustrations is something that sets the book apart. You know, we come back to pictures uh, of the title in a major way. So uh, 
First of all, these are Lewis Carroll's own illustrations in the handwritten manuscript. And you see the child that he is drawing in this uh, illustration is so different from the one that Tenniel draws uh, when he is commissioned this book uh, for publication. Uh, the color of hair is different. It's, it's two different children they, they have as their models. Uh, uh, the, the technique is uh, so very different. Tenniel's technique is much more professional with closely hatched lines. And um, Tenniel was also very, very particular with these illustrations. Uh, so for example, in this in these two pictures where Alice is entering the glass, you know, from the side of her drawing room, and she's coming out on the side of the looking glass land, everything is reversed. So it's a mirror inversion. And Tenniel also reverses his signature. So even that little detail is there. So uh, this uh, had been, the books were an inspiration for many, many other artists. And it continues to be so. So this is by Arthur Rackham. This is by Salvador Dali. And this is by a German artist, Leonard. I, I'm sorry, I, I have forgotten the name. Leonard something, but very pretty book, uh, much more recent. So um, quickly, let me sum up the influence of the uh, Alice books uh, in the literature that comes after them. So this tradition of storytelling that now we associate with the cult of childhood, um, this came naturally to Dodson because he was the eldest of a lot of siblings to whom he was always the storyteller. He brings in a lot of devices uh, to the stories, like you know, talking animals, animals who dress and talk like human beings, games, riddles, puzzles, poems, uh, parodies, uh, to enliven the books, you know, to, to break the tropes that we had talked about in the early half of the lecture. Uh, the child at the center of the book is so lifelike. As I told you, she reminds us of any modern children that we meet in modern fiction. She is naughty, but she is good at heart. She is curious and adorable. The journey as the plot, so this has become the formula for so many books after Alice. So this journey, a fantastic journey or a real journey uh, as uh, something of a bildung, as something that records a growth, uh, as something that brings in a certain lesson or some kind of enlightenment, some kind of epiphany for the child. Uh, this becomes the formula for many, many books of Alice. The child is also empowered and it is a child-centric point of view that Davis Carroll is taking. And of course, the pictures. So when we think of books like you know, Harry Potter or the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the, the Narnia series, the lineage can be traced from the Alice book. So once you see we have that point of uh, contact, the point of transition, the looking glass, once that door is open, we can easily find the back of the cupboard or you know the hole at the back of the garden with the first Alice book is a signal to the nine and three fourth platform in Harry Potter. Yes, so there is uh, a very, very, very selected bibliography, mostly books that I used uh, while I was preparing for this lecture. I am so sorry if I went terribly fast, but I did not want to make this too long. I don't know whether uh, I made sense or not. So you can. If you have any doubts, uh, you can ask me or you can get back to me. Uh, like. Right. Thank you, Gargi. Uh, but I think there might be questions. Gargi, uh, would you be um, switching on your video? would love to look at you. Yeah, I have just done that, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, if there are questions from the students. So while they're thinking, let me do what I missed out because I was uh, on the road, <laughs> jumping around. 
So yes, uh, she is Dr. Gargi Gangopadhyay, an assistant professor in the Department of English at Ramkrishna Sharada Mission Vivekananda Vidya Bhavan, Kolkata. Her doctoral thesis is "Reading Leisure: A Print Culture for Children in Colonial Bengal." It's a study of pleasure and politics in Bengal ch Bengali children's literature of the late 19th and early 20th century period. Some of her publications in the areas of history, childhood, and children's literature include book chapters in Reading Children, Essays on Children's Literature, which is by Orin Blackswan, 2009, and Nations in Children's Literature, Rutledge, 2012, and articles in South Bohemian and American Studies and Journal of Educational Media, Memory, and Society. Funded by the IFA, her research and documentation project on early Bengali children's books resulted in an open access online illustrated catalog of 19th and early 20th century Bengali children's literature. The repository children's books from Bengal, a documentation can be viewed online and she has given me the link which I will um, share with uh, the students at one point of time. So. Maybe when you all are thinking of pursuing children's literature at some point in your life, maybe one or two here, that would, she is the person to go to then, always. But with that, um, I would like, uh, if there are questions, and this is your, one of your papers, so... If there are questions, yeah, actually, like uh, Shakti, I did not go into the text because, uh, you know, that would have taken the time of another lecture. So basically, I wanted to focus on how the Alice books uh, changed the very, uh, uh, very serious, somber, didactic tradition of English children's books. That was the focus. Um, yeah, uh, I, absolutely. I did not kind of went. Um, I don't even know how you managed to cover such a huge portion <laughs> of the background and coming down, touching on the philosophy of us and then coming down to Lewis Carroll. Um, but I think you have like covered all the areas from which they can think. And if they have some questions, if they are even like generally even on children's literature, or if they are thinking in terms of Carol, because um, some of them might be. So anything that you all can think of? Uh, Prathna has written the question out. Yeah. That want to represent the contemporary age in the Alice books. Yes, Pratana, absolutely. So um, there are a lot of things that we can unearth, uh, like any other book, uh, either fantastic or realistic, uh, about the contemporary cultures. So uh, in fact, a lot is revealed about contemporary ideas of childhood, contemporary norms of childhood how the adults expected the child uh, to behave. And um, very interestingly here, uh, Alice in the story uh, is breaking some rules. So she is actually uh, taking, doing some things on her own, uh, uh, which she is not quote unquote allowed to do uh, when she is in the real world. And in that sense, uh, the, uh, the um, paradigm of uh, uh, the, the plane of the uh, of of the fantastic gives that freedom to Lewis Carroll to subvert or or you know to for Alice to negotiate the boundaries that are set on her. For example, it is very useful if we compare um, the Alice books to Jane Eyre. You know, both are stories. Of of little girls growing up, of them taking a journey. Jane Eyre is obviously it spans a greater time. But if you look at Jane's childhood, she had a 
a very foul temper and she was punished for it uh, and uh, she becomes a kind of an ideal woman who uh, is this ideal victorian lady of the house who controls her temper who tames herself and in that real world of the realistic fiction uh, Charlotte Bronte doesn't have any other way to go, but because we are operating in this dual world for the Alice text, a lot of boundaries, a lot of ground can be broken. The new grounds can be broken. Okay, uh, there is another comment. Was Alice in Wonderland the first book which put puns and riddles as a regular part of children's literature, and that's how it became a regular part of the adventure genre in general, where MC finds clues and solves these riddles. Okay, uh, it was definitely one of the first fiction to use it, but like Carol himself uh, had uh, published if I can use the word published, board games and puzzles for children. So uh, he was rather good at that because he, uh, he had a very mathematical brain. Uh, he was the professor of mathematics and logic. And so he, uh, he himself had a number of other books that had riddles and puzzles and word pictures uh, in it. But if we are talking about full-length fiction, yes, this is the first uh, thing that employs all that. There, there is an earlier comment by Prathana. I think she had written this in answer to the question uh, in respect to so imaginary stories. Um, broaden the spectrum of thoughts in children. So yes, that is how we think of children's literature now. Imaginary stories, fantasy, but it had not always been like that. And it is uh, in many ways we owe it to the Alice Fox. You know, the, the way we integrate imaginary stories or imagination in children's literature, the beginning had been with the Alice Fox. name of the father okay uh, the father of children's publisher john newbury john newbury and, and now i think there is a, an award given to the best children's book of the year the newbury medal that there's a medal in his name If uh, anyone, yes, wrongly. Yes, wrongly the is um, incidentally Gargi Ahili who was questioning oh. you is also from economics department, and wrongly okay. is uh, wrong Vishash or our economic. I I think we know each other. I know. We know, know each other well. well. I have not expected <laughs> you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Shati, can you can you just for us for a moment switch off your microphone? Because yeah, it's it was great. Okay, Gargi, thank you so much for such an exhilarating uh, lecture. I really enjoyed it. Um, I I do not have a question actually. I have a comment which is probably tangentially related to what you said, because you brought in Chardin, uh, the French artist. I was just wondering, you know, because, yeah, you brought it in a particular context, but um, I was thinking that because he was a genre painter and he plays with this, uh, I mean, he has always played with this kind of things that it, his, his, he has this entire set of paintings where uh, someone or the other is, is playing and someone else is observing it. For instance, one of the, you must be uh, familiar with this. It's a very famous painting by him. I'm just, I just quickly, uh, uh, I, I think if one wants to um, look at this, here, the, here, this is a very interesting thing that's happening. A young uh, boy is trying to, this is called soap bubble. So yeah, a young boy is trying to uh, make this bubble. 
and the child is observing him. Okay, so I was just wondering that this this kind of a gaze, and Shraddha was very famous for this. If you could bring in, a, of course, today's scope was uh, quite, you know, it uh, was limited in that sense. But if you could, at some point, bring in the child's gaze in the whole thing, you know, when a child is observing what's happening around, instead of being a uh, being an active agent, you know, I it, th this is just a thought that. Um, yes, thank you, Rongilidi. Yes, uh, um, and that, of that course, uh, thought. Yeah, that's uh, all. very, yeah. very, very pertinent. And uh, uh, and there are also I did not mention it at the time that I was talking about Philip Arias. Uh, uh, there are a lot of criticisms against uh, what he is proposing, and um, th there is a lot of support as well, and as well a lot of criticisms of people who do not buy that theory of uh, you know childhood being quote unquote discovered at the turn of the 17th century. Uh, but personally, what I feel is that there was some kind of change, uh, significant changes that. Uh, you know, came over. Not all of his evidences are are, are strong, but even if we look at literature, uh, we would you know it, it's easy to see that before a certain period, there are you know no significant child characters in uh, literature, medieval literature, for example, or old English literature, even early modern literature. You know, so so whatever he is proposing for paintings is also somewhat true for literature. But maybe I would also uh, say that the extent to which he makes it and he forms it into a kind of an argument. Uh, so it's a history is not very tidy. So it, it can't be that tidy, but definitely some kind of uh, change does uh, take place near about that time. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get get this. Oh, who are you talking about, Shad? Who are you talking about? That it's I'm talking me? about Arias. Okay. Uh, okay. The, yeah, the the historian. Okay. You know, who who proposes uh, this particular? You know, the look at the child, the adult gazing at the child, and therefore he deduces his theory of uh, children and childhood from that case. okay but it's not exactly the adult gazing at the child it's the child gazing at something beyond Be okay I, I i wouldn't say beyond the frame but it's you know the adult is doing something the young boy and the child is looking at that in that sense the child is child is the viewer the child's gaze that's what i meant okay and that is being replicated in the gaze of the painter is it so so it's a it's a frame the, the, within the a paint, frame. The painting is a typical genre painting where the you know uh, can you can you just uh, I can't do it probably. Can you just uh, 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 click on the this link? Okay. I'm trying to open it uh, in a if in it a opens chat. at all. Yeah. And then probably uh, everyone can see it if you can present it because otherwise it doesn't mean I mean we are. <laughs> Referring to something that cannot be seen, and uh... let me try opening it in a different way. I'm sorry if it's inconvenient, then we don't need to. Uh, it's do not. It. I'm just uh, this trying to put in the search and open a new tab. Yes, I found it. I think everyone can see it now. No, we can't. 
I've just shared yeah. my screen. Yeah. Reminds me of those paintings of, you know, the science experiments uh, and then the children clustered around the experiments and looking at them yeah. in awe and wonder. Yes. Um, if you want to bring in awe and wonder, then of course, but th there is also a kind of playfulness. That's because you, you, you know, you were talking about. Yes certain uh, strange juxtapositions you know of Sharda in particular uh, that 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 uh, that painting that you had used that brought to my mind this one there is also yes, a playfulness yes. here yes absolutely and you know the, the toy was very important actually from my point of view because exactly there exactly is, that's uh, why it exactly that's what I'm, I'm, I'm talking the element about. of pleasure pleasure toying and uh, the particular toy and the the the, the boys uh, the little child's uh, you know the the absolute look of uh, yes wonder and also he's enjoying it and yes. uh, the, the the whole thing is very uplifting and and that's what i was saying that it's not it's th th these are very typical elements in sharda so when you are you were separating one particular or two or three particular traits in that painting, I think there is a bigger context. That's all I was saying. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you for that, Rungilidi. No. <laughs> okay, it's very nice to talk to you, at least. <laughs> After a long time. <clears throat> we met last year in the National Library, I, I remember. Uh, I guess a long time back. Five years back or something? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gabi. Right. Um, are there any other questions, suggestions? In the way, by not really suggestions, but any other comments or observations or anything that the students would also like to think about? Okay. If they would have questions later on, uh, you can pass them my email, Shakti, if they can get in touch with me. I'd be very happy to uh, have a conversation with anybody who, who wants to. I, I could do that, yes. And uh, so just, just by way of information, I think there are two of my uh, departmental colleagues there. They've just need to join. She is the head. So she joined some time back. She was caught up in several things. Uh, and here uh, with my IP here. And we were waiting for your talk so badly. And when the day was here, I was held up in a very urgent call. And I had an additional chat. So I've got very much held up for a long time at that college. So I missed a good part of your lecture. But whatever little I heard, it was really wonderful nice that you talked and the students also learned a lot and we hope someday we'll have the lecture in person you would come down to the college and we shall have yes a that that would be very good in the yes. yes we are just looking forward to it thank you Dejani. thank um, you guys. i have also met Dejani earlier um i think at, you met because of some script assignment uh, I, yes. I talked to you I talked to you. You were the head examiner, and my mother, uh, she got, she had, she fell down. Yes, and you I had a problem. Yes. Right, but, you had a problem. Yes, but I True. didn't meet you. I once I went to your college. Uh, right, I right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, uh, it yes. was long back. She was the AG at that time. Long time back. Yes, yes. 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 Hope to meet again. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Well, Bucky was, she actually asked me whether she should come down or whether this is going to be online. So I immediately took the safe route. I said, no, 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 you're just doing it online. So, but uh, when you know, the, the only
only good thing about coming to college would be um, that there would be more others interested on students. Somehow they they are choosing the offline mode more regularly now. I think they are very very tired. Oh, that is great. I think that that is wonderful. That is something we can keep for some other time, safer times. Sure. And there's Shiva Pratim who is going to be silent, and uh, but he's been doing all the work. <laughs> he, he, <laughs> I love. Form to begin. With, um, he prefers to remain silent. Uh, so, but he's there at the quietly. So, uh, so that's about it, I guess. Gargi, I must must say it was wonderful. We have we are recording it. I I hope we can use it with your permission for some other students. You know, every time it doesn't become an occasion, maybe we can. Yes, of course you can use it uh, for uh, students. I mean, that's for what us. it is for. I, think I, I only hope I had not been uh, too fast with the lecture. I had to speed it up. But I just hope that it made sense um, uh, at some basic level for the students. And that ah. I did not bore them. I, I don't know whether they were bored. Get PPTs. Okay, I will send it to Shakti and you can have them. Have it. Uh, Garke, once again, uh, if you could kind of, you know, particularly sign the PPTs, like uh, all the slides having some kind of a your mark or whatever, because then what we can do, um, because it's a talk, I, I don't okay. know, like since it was a talk, we can put it like most, many of these recordings and everything, we put it up on the website. So they can have an access in that mm -hmm. sense. Like, okay. That can also be done. Yeah, that okay. So that. what I can do, you will have to give me some time for it. I can uh, record this lecture as a PPT. Uh, so I'll have to do it once again, and then I can send it to you. That will be, uh, you know, better uh, without interruptions or if, if you would want it that way. I think that's going to be a bonus, not better. <laughs> How? Yeah. That but um, yeah, so that that would be a bonus, really. So yes, Gargi, that that would be really nice. We are going to kill all the knack with one PPT. Yes. <laughs> we are all going that way. Yeah, I know. Let's not even begin. <laughs> so, yes, Gargi. Thanks so much once again. Thank and, you so uh, much. Thank you too. I hope. Uh, Thank I you, can, everyone. I think what I will do and share with you, and if you have any questions which you would like me to include, I do think I'm going to give them a feedback form, which is something which usually follows any any talk. So I will ask them to give a feedback. I think something that uh, we can share with you as well. Right. Right. Thank. Thank you so much, and thank you all participants here, the students. Rongilidi, so nice of you to join. And the, I had to join. The, <laughs> yes. <laughs> table Pratim, all of you. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a very good night. Do you see, um, recording has to be stopped now. Then we will, we can close this down.